1978 saw the decade begin to draw to a close, and it wasn't shaping up to be a particularly happy ending. The year was fraught with shocking acts of violence, including the grim origin of the phrase, drinking the Kool-Aid. But there were also a few bright spots, such as the debut of an exciting British rock three-piece, the first appearance of the most famous binge-eating cat in recorded history, and the release of some soon-to-be classic comedies that would begin to define the tone of pop culture in the 1980s. We're going to talk about the news, culture, sports and entertainment, and all that was weird in the 70s. This is Timeline. Get ready to learn about the inspiration behind several future Netflix documentaries, because this episode is all about 1978. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel, and let us know in the comments below your favorite 70s moment. Now get ready to believe a man can fly, because this is 1978. Harvey Milk became the first openly gay person to be elected to public office in California's history when he took his seat on San Francisco's Board of Supervisors on January 8th. Milk was an outspoken LGBTQ advocate, and during his time in office he sponsored a successful bill that prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. But his time as a public servant would be cut short. More on that later in the year. The final Volkswagen Beetle to be manufactured in Germany rolled out of the factory just under two weeks later, on the 19th. Officially known as the Volkswagen Type 1, the popular automobile would continue to be manufactured in Brazil and Mexico until 2003, making it the longest-running and most manufactured car model in history. Far out, man. Eleven days later, legendary talk show host Larry King went on the air nationwide for the first time, when the Larry King Show premiered on the 30th. In a format that would become the bedrock of his career, King's Daily Show would begin with an interview with a guest and end with King taking calls from his listeners. The Larry King Show would stay on the air until 1994 and would be spun off into King's massively popular TV talk show, Larry King Live, in 1985. Embattled film director Roman Polanski fled the United States the next day, hopping a plane to London to avoid a prison sentence for unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor. Polanski pleaded guilty to the charge as part of a deal to avoid jail time, but he had heard that the judge intended to throw out the deal and slap him with a 50-year sentence. The director flew from London to his home country of France the following day, where he has mostly remained ever since. Less than a week later, the infamous Blizzard of 78 struck the Northeast United States, burying the Midwest and East Coast in some serious snow. The storm lingered for two days, delivering record-breaking snowfalls of over 20 inches in several areas. By the time the storm broke up on February 7th, it had claimed approximately 100 lives and caused over half a billion dollars in damage. A week later, the first micro on a chip was patented by Texas Instruments on Valentine's Day. Well, that's romantic. Designed by Gary Boone and Michael Cochran, the chip was used in Texas Instruments' iconic educational toy, Speak and Spell, which was unveiled four months later at the Consumer Electronics Show. E.T. would later use this revolutionary technology in the 80s to phone home. 10-1 underdog Leon Spinks defeated the reigning heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali the next day. Spinks outlasted the legendary champ, winning by decision, becoming the first person ever to strip Ali of his world title in the ring. However, Spinks would lose that title just over a month later, when he refused to defend his heavyweight belt against number one contender Ken Norton. March kicked off with a bizarre heist. Two auto mechanics stole the earthly remains of Charlie Chaplin on the first. The two men exhumed the famed filmmaker's casket and attempted to ransom it to Chaplin's widow, Una, for $600,000. She refused, which turned out to be the right move. The culprits were caught just five weeks later, and Chaplin was reburied in a concrete grave to prevent future criminal entrepreneurs from getting any ideas. Notorious Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint was wounded by a sniper on the 6th of March. Flint and his lawyer were struck by gunfire outside of a courthouse in Gwinnett County, Georgia, where Flint was scheduled to appear to fight obscenity charges. Although both men survived the attack, Flint was left partially paralyzed and had difficulty speaking for the rest of his life. We'll be right back. Hey, this Christmas party is getting a little too quiet. I think it's time we liven it up with my favorite Christmas gift, Mr. Microphone. Hey, what's that? Well, you set the dial on your FM radio and testing, testing, testing. testing. Hey. I'm on the radio. 
The perfect Christmas gift at Walgreens, Woolworth, Woolco, Osco, Venture, Weebolts, Montgomery Ward. David Banner is believed to be dead, and he must let the world think that he is dead until he can find a way to control the raging spirit that dwells within him. Tragedy struck on March 22nd when famed high wire performer Carl Willenda fell while performing a televised tightrope walk between two towers of the Condado Plaza Hotel in Puerto Rico. Walenda was the founding member and patriarch of the Flying Walendas, a family of daredevil performers known for their thrilling stunts, which were usually done without any safety nets. That was the case when Walenda fatally plummeted 121 feet from the Condado Hotel, succumbing to his injuries at age 73. Because bringing happiness is the only thing that's important to me. So don't be surprised if I show up on your unhappy doorstep someday. Better yet, be surprised, because I'm not doing this again. Breaking off antennas, stealing pantyhose. Who, who would do something like that? Probably the notorious car antenna pantyhose gang. You try getting along without your car radio. Well, try getting along without your pantyhose. <laughs> this is work, honey. I told you I'm Ewing Oil's Goodwill Ambassador. Got a whole satchel full of Goodwill there. Yeah. Daddy calls them bees. Booze, broads, and booty. It's what keeps the independent oilman independent. Moving into April, influential astronomer and writer Carl Sagan won a Pulitzer Prize on the 17th of April for his nonfiction book, The Dragons of Eden, about the evolution of human intelligence. Sagan would later use some of the same ideas from his prize-winning book in his popular miniseries, Cosmos. The Dragons of Eden would eventually get a sequel when, 24 years later, the follow-up book Up From Dragons was published, co-written by Sagan's son, Dorion. Back in 78, May saw the breakout film of an unknown martial arts star named Jackie Chan. Chan's action comedy, Snake in the Eagle's Shadow, was released on the first, introducing audiences around the world to his signature slapstick fighting style for the first time. We've been injuring ourselves and spinning ladders ever since. The first ever spam email was sent two days later on the third. The message was sent by Gary Thurk, a marketer working for Digital Equipment Corporation, who bombed the inboxes of nearly 400 ARPANET users, trying to get them to come to some sweet sales presentation for the company's line of computers. And with that click of the send button, Nigerian princes were given their most formidable weapon. Later that month, the phrase glass ceiling was coined for the first time on the 24th by a New York telephone company manager named Marilyn Loden. Loden was speaking on a panel at the 1978 Women's Exposition in New York when she used the phrase to describe the invisible barrier preventing women from advancing as far as men in their chosen careers. Well, different work now. Let's get to it. Tonight, Geraldo Rivera reports on how greyhound racing dogs get their taste for the chase. A grizzly sport, but it has its fans. Sandy! Daddy? What are you, what are you doing here? I, I, I thought you were going back to Australia. We had a change of plan. Okay. <laughs> well, that's cool, baby. Moving into June, the very first Garfield comic strip was published on the 19th, and the cubicle walls of your unfunny co-workers have never been the same since. Created by cartoonist Jim Davis, the daily adventures of a sarcastic cat and his dim-witted owner quickly became one of the most popular comic strips in history, at one point appearing in over two and a half thousand newspapers, multiple television specials, cartoon series, and live-action movies, and generating nearly a billion dollars in annual merchandising revenue. That is a lot of lasagna. We'll be right back. Zonk, if you want a date, get in shape. Shape? I'm solid steel. Uh-uh. Schick shape, Zonk. Schick shape. Get clean, get close, get comfort too. Get your face in schick shape. Click in Schick Super 2, the only twin blades Teflon coated for incredibly comfortable close shaves. Great shape, Zonk. That's schick shape. That's Super 2. The first rainbow pride flag was used at the Gay and Lesbian Freedom Day Parade in San Francisco. Created by a clothing designer named Gilbert Baker as a new symbol for the city's LGBT community, the flag immediately resonated with the parade goers and was adopted as an icon of gay pride. I'm a zit. Get it? No. 
George Romero brings us the most intensely shocking motion picture experience for all times. Dawn of the Dead. Moving into the fall, The Who's party boy drummer Keith Moon finally self-destructed on the 7th. Long suffering from alcoholism, Moon had moved into a new flat in London to try and get sober with the help of a prescription sedative used to treat alcohol withdrawal. Moon's addictive personality was no match for the powerful medication, and he OD'd, passing away at the age of 32. Three days later, Mario Andretti won his first Formula One World Drivers' Championship, coming in ahead of Austrian driver Niki Lauda, who you may remember from an earlier Timeline episode. Andretti would go on to become one of the most famous drivers in the history of professional racing, having claimed victories in Formula One, NASCAR, and IndyCar. He also had three guest appearances on Home Improvement, that's when you know you've really hit the big time. The next day, the last known victim of smallpox succumbed to the disease, one of the deadliest afflictions in human history. Medical photographer Janet Parker contracted the malignant virus from the smallpox laboratory where she worked. The head of the lab, Professor Henry Bedson, was so distraught over Parker's infection that he took his own life just a few days before she passed away. The World Health Organization officially declared smallpox eradicated in 1980. Oh, no, no, it's just that they told me I'd be starting work today as a driver. Oh, here's my hack line. You're a cab driver? Uh-huh. What do you mean busting my chops here, make them believe you're a regular person? <laughs> Turning to music, the Grateful Dead played three nights of concert at the Giza Pyramid Complex in Cairo, Egypt, beginning the night of September 14th. The proceeds of the show were donated to the Egyptian Department of Antiquities and to the Faith and Hope Society, the favorite charity of Egypt's then First Lady, Jihan Sadat. Originally intended to be recorded and released as a live album, those plans were shelved for various technical and logistical reasons until the album was finally released 30 years later, almost to the day, on September 30th, 2008. You must revolt against your oppressors. You have nothing to lose but your shells. In the great tradition of these laugh masters of the past come two guys who are hysterically funny. They're Cheech and Chong. In late September, Pope John Paul I unexpectedly passed away on the 28th after serving just 33 days. The September Pope, as he came to be known, relinquished the papacy after succumbing to a sudden heart attack at age 65. He was succeeded by Pope John Paul II, hey, that's chronological, who was elected just over two weeks later on October 16th. John Paul II would go on to become the second longest serving Pope in modern history, wearing the big pointy hat for 27 years until his death in 2005. Heading into October, the Sex Pistols' infamous bassist, Sid Vicious, was charged with the second degree murder of his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen. Spungen had been found in the couple's room in New York's Hotel Chelsea by staff the previous day with a stab wound to her abdomen. Vicious admitted to the attack, but his highly intoxicated state, combined with his differing accounts of the event, have kept the exact details a mystery to this day. Staying with music, English rock band The Police played their first U.S. show at New York City's CBGB's eight days later. The show was part of an American tour, during which the then-unknown band drove themselves from city to city in an Econoline van. Wonder how many red lights they ran. Say, what's your name? My name is Dorothy. Dorothy and Toto. What intelligent names. <laughs> <laughs> what's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. Kicking off November with some tough love, the iconic documentary film Scared Straight premiered on television on the 2nd. Directed by Arnold Shapiro, the gritty film follows a group of juvenile offenders as they interact with real-life convicts at New Jersey's Rahway State Prison. The inmates scream at, berate, and otherwise terrify the teenagers in an effort to scare them straight by exposing them to the grueling realities of life behind bars. The film was notably aired uncensored, marking the first time certain four-letter expletives were ever uttered on American network television. We'll be right back. We took everything that was wrong with children's television and got rid of it. We kept everything that was good about it and made it better. The result is Nickelodeon, the young people's satellite network. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Did you just hear what I heard? Her kids are in school in other countries, and she likes it that way. Yeah, and we're in a lot of trouble. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Washington, D.C. elected Marion Barry Jr. as the city's first black mayor on November the 7th. Barry had been a civil rights activist in the 1960s and had served as the president of the Lemoyne Owens College chapter of the NAACP while he was a student there. The controversial politician would go on to serve four non-consecutive terms as DC's mayor. One day later, legendary slice of life artist Norman Rockwell passed away at his home in Stockbridge, Massachusetts at age 84. Rockwell was best known for the covers he painted for the Saturday Evening Post, which presented an idyllic view of life in small-town America. At the time of his death, he had produced over 4,000 original works for magazines, movie posters, advertisements, and books, making him one of the most prolific artists of the modern era. Controversial cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead passed away one week later at age 76. Mead rose to prominence with her books Coming of Age in Samoa and Sex and Temperament in Three Primate Societies, in which she argued that culture, rather than biology, had a profound effect on human development, and advocated for the relaxing of rigid sexual norms and gender roles in modern society. She also served as an assistant curator at New York's American Museum of Natural History for over 50 years, which is enough time to name all of the dinosaur skeletons. That's it, I'm turning back. I know your family's waiting. I know it's an important day. Three days later, cult leader Jim Jones directed and manipulated hundreds of his followers to take their own lives at his Jonestown commune in Guyana on November 18th. Jones became paranoid after U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan visited the commune to investigate allegations of abuse and illegal activity. Jones ordered the assassination of Ryan and his group, who were ambushed on an airstrip as they attempted to leave with some Jonestown defectors. Altogether, 909 lives were lost at Jonestown, including Ryan. One of the most notorious errors in NFL history occurred the next day, when New York Giants quarterback Joe Pisarczyk fumbled an easy handoff to fullback Larry Zonka, resulting in a game-winning touchdown by the Philadelphia Eagles. In what came to be known as the miracle at the Meadowlands, Eagles cornerback Herman Edwards scooped up the fumbled handoff with seconds left in the game and scored the touchdown that gave Philadelphia their shocking comeback win. San Francisco was struck by tragedy eight days later, when newly elected supervisor Harvey Milk was assassinated alongside Mayor George Moscone by disgruntled former supervisor Dan White. White had resigned from his position weeks earlier in protest of the low salary, and had formed a rivalry with Milk over the course of the year. White claimed he had spiraled into a depression and wasn't fully in control of his actions, and was ultimately convicted, serving just five years in prison before taking his own life in 1985. Milk's life would later be the subject of an award-winning film, 2008's Milk, starring Sean Penn in the title role. One week later, Dianne Feinstein was named mayor of San Francisco, following the slaying of Mayor George Moscone. Feinstein had been serving as the president of the city's board of supervisors, and had delivered the news of Milk's demise to her shocked constituents. You remember the trees? You remember all the different ways of the trees? Remember that? You remember? Huh? The mountains? You remember all that? One shot. One shot. One shot. <laughs> God, look up there. What the hell is that? Easy, miss. I've got you. You... you've got me? Who's got you? <laughs> Nobody's favorite clown, John Wayne Gacy, was arrested on December 21st after confessing to the slaying of more than 30 teenage boys and young men. Gacy had been collecting victims for years. Police discovered several sets of remains buried in the crawlspace beneath his house. Gacy was ultimately convicted of 33 counts of homicide, at the time the most ever attributed to a single person. And so the sun set on 1978, with the cinematic debut of one of America's greatest heroes and the arrest of one of its worst villains. 1979 was on deck with a hip new portable music craze, the debut of two future NBA legends, and the arrival of the most significant political figure in modern American history. Yeah, old rappin' Ronnie is on the way. But that's next year. Coming soon, 1979. 
So what do you think? What was the biggest moment of 1978? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other groovy timeline videos.